Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Peter Newfeld. I'm a partner at the firm Wagner Sidlowski LLP. Uh, I'm here as the co-chair for this Lunch and Learn series, along with uh, my colleague, Professor David Friedman. Uh, this series, if you haven't attended uh, any of the seminars yet, this series is about issues in family law and estate law generally. Uh, the similar duplicating issues uh, in those two fields of law. Uh, the subtopic that we're speaking about today is enforcing support obligations in separation agreements and court orders against an estate. Uh, we have a an overview, uh, uh, I'd say a list of, of things to consider uh, in this area, which was prepared by our presenters today. That's Craig Vanderzee and Megan O'Connor. Um, so that has been prepared in advance of this seminar. There's a link to that that can be found in the Zoom chat. Uh, so I encourage you to access that and download it. Uh, the certificate of attendance will also be posted in the in the chat momentarily for you to download, as you're all probably familiar with at this point. Once you exit out of a, a Zoom meeting, you can't access anything in the chat. So download everything once it comes to you in the Zoom chat before uh, you leave today's presentation. A few housekeeping notes. Uh, please ensure that your microphones are muted at all times uh, unless you're asking a question at the end of the presentation after which we ask that you mute yourself again once you've uh, asked the question uh, please also note that the seminar is being recur recorded i think you may have heard that uh, before i started speaking we've got two presenters today like i mentioned craig vandersee and megan o'connor uh, Craig Vandersee is a partner at Torkin Mains LLP in the Trust and Estates Litigation Group. Uh, Craig is certified by the Law Society of Ontario as a specialist in estates and trust law. He is known as one of the estates uh, bar's top mediators in Ontario. Aside from mediation, Craig's practice includes all aspects of estate trusts, capacity, fiduciary, and power of attorney disputes, and uh, litigation for clients consisting of individuals, trust companies, government agencies, the list goes on. Uh, Megan O'Connor is an associate with Torkin Mains. In their family law group, she advises clients on a wide range of matters, including spousal support, of course, as well as contracts and agreements related thereto, uh, property and all other financial matters resulting from the uh, breakdown of a relationship. Prior to joining Torkin Mains, Megan was an associate at a, another prominent uh, family law firm in Toronto, as well as counsel for Children's Aid Society in Toronto. Uh, a big thank you to our sponsors today. We have Scotia Wealth Management, uh, the Benet Brith, Epstein Cole, Concentra Trust, BMO Private Wealth, uh, TD, Torque and Main, Solos Trust, as well as We're Folds. Uh, this event is complimentary because of them, so we thank you. If you've enjoyed uh, the seminar, uh, we ask that you consider making a donation to the Benet Brith uh, Canada Food Program if you haven't already. Uh, and if you want to make another donation, uh, please do. Uh, the link for that is in the chat. Uh, we're going to have Richard Robertson here today from the B'nai B'rith to uh, speak for uh, a minute or so. He is the Director of Research and Advocacy at B'nai B'rith Canada. Uh, so he's here to tell us a little bit about the organization and its charitable work. Uh, go ahead, Richard. Thank you so much, Peter. So today I just wanted to update you on some of the work that our Community Cares Department is doing to help seniors in our community. Uh, our approach to helping seniors is fourfold. We provide seniors with housing, with clothing, with a food program, which Peter briefly mentioned, and as well with community engagement. Um, as, our, as our community continues to age, we at B'nai B'rith uh, will endeavor to continue to meet the needs of seniors uh, across Canada. We operate our food programs in Montreal, in Toronto, and in Winnipeg, and we offer our Seniors Cares community programs in those three cities as well. So I wanted on behalf of B'nai B'rith to thank you all for your continued support and to provide you with a little bit of an update on what that money goes towards. So thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much. And sorry, I just noticed that my uh, camera was off for a little bit, but appreciate that, Richard. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna start off uh, the presentation. Uh, Megan O'Connor is going to start us off. Go ahead, Megan. Thanks, Peter. It's lovely to be with everybody here today. Uh, as Peter said, Craig and I will be talking about how to enforce support obligations from two different lenses. I'm going to start off with mechanisms for enforcing support while the payor is still alive. And then Craig will be taking, or sorry, talking about what happens after the payor has died. 
Uh, my portion of the presentation will be divided into two kind of buckets. So the first one being enforcement mechanisms that are available to support recipients directly. And the second being how the support orders can be enforced through the Family Responsibility Office or the FRO. Uh, so this is a really broad topic. My goal today is to give a high level overview of the options that are available. This is by no means an exhaustive list of the options or the criteria to consider in terms of each of the options. It really depends on the facts of the case at hand and that way you can determine which option is better for the recipient. Since the starting point for everything we are going to be talking about today is the support order itself or the support agreement, um, I wanted to take a few minutes to review the standard and required language in order for that order or agreement to be enforceable. Uh, so we provided a draft order with our materials for today that kind of outlines the different uh, standard language that you see oftentimes in those kinds of support orders. Uh, the Government of Ontario website also provides a really helpful guide for how to draft a clear and complete support order. Um, I've copied the link for the Ontario Regulation 18202 in our materials as well. Uh, this regulation is really helpful um, in terms of new lawyers or anybody who's not familiar practicing with family law because it provides uh, precedent with standard support terms for both child and spousal support orders. When you break it down, the necessary requirements in a support order are, first and foremost, most importantly, you have to quantify the dollar amount, the frequency, and the start date for the support payments. So, for example, commencing June 1st, 2024, and on the first day of each month thereafter, the payor shall pay $1,000 per month in table child support to the recipient, something along those lines. Uh, it's important to specify that the payor has an obligation to pay the support and not just share. This is more applicable when we're talking about things like children's section seven expenses. Um, we often refer to that as sharing these expenses, expenses in proportion to the pay or the party's incomes. Um, but you have to make sure that you're referencing that they are paying that support obligation. Where possible, especially in terms of Section 7 expenses, you should always quantify the certain expense. Um, so if, for example, the parties are sharing Section 7 expenses equally, and you know for a fact that one child has dance classes that are $150 per month, be specific in the order that the payor is responsible for paying $75 per month. Um, this is particularly important when you're enforcing through FRO because if a section seven expense cannot be set in a fixed amount, the order has to specify that the expense is one that must be claimed on a sworn statement of arrears that is submitted by the support recipient. Otherwise, FRO won't be able to enforce this section of the support order. Where applicable, you should also ensure that you're including any termination dates for support. We see a lot of support orders that are fixed term type things, like they apply for the next four years. Um, and that's really important for FRO to understand. Other examples of termination clauses would be if, for example, the child is it's going to terminate by January 1st, 2025, because the child has reached the age of majority or is no longer a child as defined by the Divorce Act. If you know that costs are being awarded in a proceeding, they can also be enforced as support through FRO, but the order has to specifically include that the costs are related to support and maintenance. So this is an important consideration when you're uh, drafting the final order. In addition to these points, uh, in order for FRO to be able to enforce the support order, it has to include the standard FRO enforcement clause, which states, unless the support order is withdrawn from the Family Responsibility Office, it shall be enforced by the director and amounts owing under the order shall be paid to the director who shall pay them to the person to whom they are owed. Again, all of this is set out in the prepared draft order that was with our materials. Uh, so moving on to the first bucket. So um, that would be enforcement mechanisms outside of the Family Responsibility Office. Um, there are a number of mechanisms that are available to recipients personally through the family law rules, and this can specifically be found at rules 26 through 30. These enforcement mechanisms apply to both temporary and final orders and orders that are made to e made pursuant to either the Divorce Act or the Family Law Act. Uh, so an easy one to start with is um, under Rule 27, and that's just a straight up request for a financial statement. Once the request is served on the payor, they have to provide a sworn financial statement within 15 days. Um, this request can only be made by the recipient every six months unless there is an order to the contrary. If the payor does not provide the financial statement on time, the, the recipient can seek a court order that the payor do so. The utility of requesting a financial statement is really twofold. So first, it identifies the payor's income sources and it sets out their assets for the purposes of garnishment and other enforcement tools like seizure and sale of personal property. 
Um, second, if the payor does not serve a financial statement within 10 days of a court order requiring them to do so, the recipient can actually bring a motion to imprison the payor for up to 40 days. So this remedy is akin to a, a contempt order, which is otherwise not available as an enforcement tool under the family law rules. So it's really helpful to know that that is something that's available to recipients. Support recipients can also make a request for disclosure from an income source directly. So once a support order falls into default, if the recipient knows where the payor works, all they have to do is serve a request for a disclosure on the income source, so on the person's um, employer, and that income source is required to confirm if they are paying the payor, and if so, provide the details regarding the nature and frequency of the income that is being paid. Again, the helpful part for this is that it in turn provides the recipient with the information needed to garnish a payor's wages directly from the source. The other kind of financial remedy is under Rule 2717. So with this, the recipient can request that a financial examination occur. It allows them to ask questions and obtain information from the payor regarding the reason for the payor's default in payment, their income and property, any debts that are owed, um, the payor's ability to pay the order either in the past, present, or future, and things like whether the payor intends to comply with the, the order amongst other things. Um, so similar to a request for a financial statement, if the payor refuses to attend for a financial examination after a court order has been made requiring them to do so, the recipient has the option to bring a motion seeking for the payor to be imprisoned for up to 30 days. So there are some very dire consequences that can come from not um, abiding by any of these kinds of requests for information. So moving on to the next option, that's under Rule 28, and this is for a seizure and sale of a uh, payor's property. Um, again, has to have a default of the payment, but as soon as that happens, the recipient just has to file a request for writ and seizure and sale um, and a statement of the money owed with the court. And then once the clerk issues the writ and it being filed with the sheriff, it continues in effect until it's withdrawn or the court orders otherwise. A primary benefit to this is, is that it enables the recipient to direct the sheriff to sell the defaulting payer's property and pay the proceeds to the recipient. This can be, you know, a writ of seizure and sale can be exhausted or sorry, ex executed against land owned by the payor or their personal property. There's really only certain exemptions, such as necessary clothing for the debtor and their dependents, um, tools, and any other kind of property that's used by the debtor to earn an income that are not exceeding the amount that's owed, um, or one car that is of a value not exceeding the amount that's owed, things like that. Uh, under Rule 29, you can, it sets, Rule 29 sets up the garnishment procedure available to a support recipient. Um, so this is also a relatively easy way for recipients to move forward with trying to uh, enforce their support obligations. Uh, the recipient essentially files a request for garnishment and a statement of money owed with the court. Um, and the clerk can make as many notices of garnishment as requested by the recipient. So uh, there will be lots of circumstances where the payor has multiple different income sources, such as uh, tax refund through CRA, um, you just straight up employment income if they're a T4 employee, any of those kinds of things, they can issue a notice of garnishment. The payor has the ability to dispute the notice of garnishment. Um, if that happens, there will be a notice of garnishment hearing. And at that appearance, the court can make a number of different orders, such as dismissing the dispute. Um, they can change the amount to be garnished on a, uh, an account of a periodic order. Um, they can uh, set aside the notice of garnishment altogether, depending on the situation. Any of those kinds of remedies are available to the court if there is a, a challenge. The grounds for a payor to dispute a garnishment are quite limited. Um, so the leading case that sets out the grounds uh, is, is Sneed and Sneed. Um, that's 2003 Carswell ONT 4304. At paragraph 25 of that case, Justice Reinhart sets out the list of grounds. So that includes things like the debtor did not actually owe money to the creditor because the amounts had already been paid or the debtor owed a lesser sum than what was claimed by the creditor. So pretty clear and, and understanding reasons why the notice of the garnishment would be set aside, but good to know. Uh, if the parties are in an active litigation, the recipient can also seek security provisions in their pleadings and support orders pursuant to Section 341K of the Family Law Act. Um, this permits the court to make interim or final orders requiring that payment be secured by a charge on property or otherwise. The leading case with respect to this is Kumar and Kumar. Um, the citation is in our materials for today. At paragraph six, Justice Rosenberg listed the number of criteria 
um, listed, sorry, listed a number of criteria for when ordering security for support will be applicable. So that includes situations where a party has a history of dissipating assets, uh, where the payor is likely to leave the jurisdiction and in effect become an absconding debtor, uh, where there is a history of the payor refusing to honor a support obligation, whether that's pursuant to a court order agreement. Um, so there's six of them and that's just a snapshot of what they are. Uh, one of the methods of enforcement through FRO that I'll discuss later is the suspension of a payor's driver's license. So this option is not available to recipients directly, but they request that the pay, but you can request that the payor's passport be deposited with, with the court for security for support. Um, so this was found to be an appropriate method of security in the 2012 Jones and Hugo case. Um, so that one is also cited in our materials. There are also other remedies available, such as a default hearing or for the recipient to seek to strike the payor's pleadings under Rule 18 of the Family Law Rules. Um, these are a little bit more aggressive and they're usually remedies of last resort. Turning over to our second bucket is to look at how support orders are enforced through the Family Responsibility Office or the FRO, that's how I'll be referring to it. Um, FRO has the authority to enforce support orders through the Family Responsibility and Support Arrears Enforcement Act. When the court makes a support order, they will also require the parties to file what is called a support deduction order and a support deduction order information form. This empowers the FRO to deduct the support from payments otherwise payable to the payor by an income source. So again, this can include income from sources such as their regular wages, commissions or bonuses that they receive from their employer, uh, disability, retirement, or other pensions, vacation pay, termination pay, and even severance pay, and tax refunds. If the FRO is forced to garnish income because the payor defaults in making the payments voluntarily, they will issue a support deduction notice, and that is then sent to their income source. Once that is sent to the income source, they are obligated to deduct the amount owing per the notice from the income they owe to the payor and to instead pay that to FRO. So in other words, once a uh, support deduction notice is sent to the payor's employer, they are obligated to take up to 50% of the net amount owed to the payor and pay it to FRO instead. Uh, the only exception to this with um, the 50% rule is if the income source is a tax refund or an amount payable pursuant to the Family Orders and Agreements Enforcement Assistance Act, in which case up to 100% of the net amount can be deducted. So if you're a payor and you're about to get a $10,000 tax refund for the, the previous tax filing year, um, the entire amount can be sent over to the resort re support recipient if FRO is enforcing. Uh, FRO has, uh, in addition to garnishing directly from an income source, uh, FRO can garnish joint bank accounts. So, and that doesn't just mean joint bank accounts for the recipient and the payor. It can be joint bank accounts that the payor shares with other third parties. Uh, FRO just has to issue notice to the applicable financial institution, and then they can start getting that going. FRO can also garnish 100% of lottery winnings of $1,000 or more, so long as those winnings are payable pursuant to the OLG. So if you win the lottery outside of Ontario, um, that cannot be enforced in the same capacity. In addition to this, FRO can report to agencies, organizations, and professional bodies. Um, so for example, they can, re they can report to consumer reporting agencies. Uh, this then in turn impacts a payer's credit score and their subsequent ability to qualify for things like mortgages. It could also mean a payor's professional organization um, or an entity that is responsible for licensing individuals for occupational purposes. A uh, primary example of this would be all of us here today as lawyers. Uh, if you are a support payor who falls into default, FRO can notify, for example, the Law Society of Ontario, and this can impact your good standing with the Law Society of Ontario. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, one of the nicer features of FRO is that they have the option to suspend a payor's driver's license. They can do this um, upon 30 days notice to the payor, and it can be up to an indefinite period, so they don't have to specify it's for 30, 60, 90 days. They can just suspend your license indefinitely. The only way to avoid this occurring for a payor is to, one, pay the arrears that are owing under the order, 
Two, make a satisfactory arrangement with Fro to start paying off the arrears. Three, um, the payor obtains a refraining order. Uh, so a, a refraining order is effectively an order from the court that stops Fro from being able to suspend the driver's license. Uh, payors can obtain the refraining order if, for example, they have commenced a motion to change the order that is being enforced, or if there is an active appeal of the order being enforced. The court is only able to grant a refraining order if the payor seeks it within 30 days of obtaining notice from FRO of their intention to suspend. Uh, the court otherwise does not have any authority to grant it. And interestingly, once this 30-day period is up, only FRO has the discretion to direct the Registrar of Motor Vehicles to reinstate the license. There's nothing that allows the court or provides them the authority to override FRO's ability to do this. So this is really important because you know, losing your license can really impact a lot of people's ability to meet their support obligations in terms of what their work is. And so you need to know that that step has to be taken within 30 days of getting notice. Otherwise, it's up to you to satisfy any kind of arrears that have, have come up. And the most aggressive form of, enfor of enforcement that's available to FRO is a default hearing. Um, so this compels the payor to come to court. Some of the orders that the court can make at a default hearing would be uh, payment of all or part of the arrears by any such periodic or lump sum payment as the court considers just. Um, they can require the payor to report periodically to the court, the director, or any other specified person on a regular basis. And the big one, um, payors can be imprisoned continuously or intermittently for a period not exceeding 180 days. At the default hearing stage, the court is not able to undertake an analysis of whether the support order is appropriate. It is just how to enforce that support order. And the only way for the payor to get out of a default hearing is to be able to show an inability to pay due to valid reasons. Uh, valid reasons could include an event over which the payor has no control and which renders the payor totally without assets or income with which to meet their obligations. So this would be, for example, if they have a disabling illness or um, involuntary unemployment, and they're therefore unable to actually pay off their support obligations. FRO does have considerable discretion to decline to enforce a support order, and this can be found pursuant to Section 7 of the Family Responsibility and Support Arrears Enforcement Act. This includes situations where the support is nominal, uh, where support can't easily be determined on the face of the order. So this goes back to what we discussed at the beginning of the presentation around the importance of having clear and identifiable terms. Uh, another example would be that the recipient hasn't complied with reasonable requests for information to allow the director to enforce. Um, so if, for example, the director says, I need to know where they live, where the payor works, um, when was the last time you talked to them, any of those kinds of reasonable inquiries that the director makes, if they go unanswered, FRO can decline to enforce. And the biggest one for folks to consider is really a situation where a support recipient repeatedly accepts payment directly from the payor. This confuses and complicates FRO's ability to know what is outstanding. And if that happens on a regular basis, then they will discontinue their enforcement. There are also situations that require FRO to terminate their enforcement of support. Um, so this is found under Section 8 of the FRASEA. So again, that is the uh, Family Responsibility and Support Arrears Enforcement Act. Um, and so some of these include the parties to the support order or the support deduction order agree that the support obligation has terminated. In that case, you can file a notice of withdrawal with the FRO that's found on their website. It's a really easy one to do. Um, Another example is that the support order has, states that the support obligation terminates on a set calendar date and that arrives. So again, it comes back to fixed kind of spousal support or, sp or child support terms that say uh, pay or will pay X for the next four years, at which point the support terminates. Uh, another one would be if a court orders that the obligation has terminated um, and a bigger one, which will segue nicely into Craig's discussion is uh, the pay or dies. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Craig to discuss enforcement after the payor's death. Thanks, Megan. So one of the spouses that is the payor has died. What do you do? Uh, sure, everyone can think the first step should be, well, I'm gonna go to court and I'm gonna enforce. Well, what are you going to enforce? So 
before you think and strategize about the manner of uh, uh, enforcing a support uh, obligation or potential support right, um, a number of considerations uh, should indeed be put on the table and with the client, that is the surviving spouse, to determine the circumstance and the context in which you're operating and in which you're trying to strategize how uh, in a most cost efficient and timely way to achieve the results uh, for your client, which is enforcing the support or support rights. So where might you start? Um, well, first of all, what was the support obligation? Was it by way of an informal agreement? Is it a case where two spouses uh, decided to separate and um, decided that they didn't want to pay lawyers. Um, they wanted to keep the costs down and it was relatively amicable, but they did it by way of an email or they did it by way of an, a text and they did, or they did it by way of an informal agreement, it, agreement that they thought was binding, but nevertheless, one that didn't involve uh, lawyers. So that's a context where there isn't a formal agreement involving lawyers and certain assurances uh, and uh, certificates of ILA having been obtained and no court order. So is that your starting point? Uh, is your starting point uh, a domestic contract? Uh, and by that, I mean a cohabitation agreement, a marriage contract, or a separation agreement. What do those agreements say? Um, do they address spousal rights? Do they waive spousal rights in the event of death? Do they... Um, uh, deal with spousal rights or spousal support post-death. So going to the agreement to determine what, in fact, it says. It may be the case that even if these documents uh, deal with support obligations or waiving support obligations, that the right to uh, still pursue and obtain support can be there under the SLRA um, or by enforcing these documents. But it's important to understand what the base documents are. Um, and then in considering those documents, should those documents, whichever one would be applicable, uh, have consideration as to whether it should be set aside or a provision of it set aside prior to trying to enforce support. Pretty difficult to go to court and demand that an estate um, uh, uh, honor support obligations in a contract and then a year later decide, oh, wait a second, Notwithstanding, we have a court order saying that this is a valid agreement and an estate should honor it and pay the support um, under it, we're now going to try to set it aside. So this is a consideration that you may want to have or should have, uh, I say, before you're going to go into court. It's finding out, um, again, what these pre-existing rights are. Um, are there beneficial designations? Are there life insurance policies that have beneficial designations? Is the life insurance policy uh, designated to the surviving spouse um, as a result of a court order that makes it irrevocable uh, to the surviving spouse um, or not? Perhaps it's just a life insurance policy that's been designated to the surviving spouse or perhaps to someone else. Are there investment accounts? Are there bank accounts? Um, are there any other types of accounts that have been designated uh, uh, to the surviving spouse? Of course, when you go to court, you want to understand what the financial context is. And if you're going to be bringing a claim under the SLRA, the Succession Law Reform Act, um, understanding what assets um, are already obtainable uh, by your respective client or were intended perhaps to deal with the issue of support. Um, also, bear in mind the changes to the um, uh, SLRA that were effective January 1, 2002, as it pertains to um, the rights of a surviving spouse under a will, um, if the testator had a will, or in the case of an intestacy. So when you're looking at a will, um, uh, it's just bearing in mind, again, you're doing this so you're trying to determine what your client may or may not be entitled to before going to court or before reaching out to uh, an estate trustee, is bearing in mind that as a result of the changes effective January 1, 2022 to the SLRA, that a testator's marriage after the date of his or her will no longer revokes that will. So that's an important um, uh, item to bear in mind. Also, we know that 
um, under Section 17.2 of the SLRA, in the case of a divorced spouse, um, uh, the uh, a bequest under a will or an appointment of that surviving spouse as an estate trustee um, or executor or uh, a special power appointment are considered revoked. And the will shall be construed as if the former spouse had predeceased uh, the testator. Now, with the changes to the SLRA January 1, 2022, that um, subsection was extended to separated spouses. So uh, again, it, separated spouses will now have that same treatment um, uh, if they're considered separated pursuant to section section 17.4 of the SLRA. And in the materials that we provided, um, about 10 or 11 pages, um, it was done in point form, and this is referenced in that document. Also, in the case of an intestacy, prior to the changes uh, to the SLRA, again, effective January 1, 2022, um, with an intestacy, any uh, legally married spouse, whether separated or not, would have been entitled to receive the preferential share, which is now $350,000, plus potentially the entirety of the residue of the estate if there was no children or if there is children, a portion of that res residue. So with that change, um, Section 43 of the SLRA dealing with the intestacy no longer extends to a separated spouse and um, that separated spouse being entitled to the preferential share or a portion of the residue. So again, it's keeping in mind where your client stands before you're going to go to court. Was there a support order? Um, and what kind of support order? Was it a support order made under the uh, Family Law Act? Was it a support order made under the Divorce Act? Under the Family Law Act, we know that Section 34.4 of that act provides that an order for support binds the payer's estate unless the order provides otherwise. But does the order um, indicate uh, that it will stop as of date of death? Does the support order indicate that as part of it, and a sample of this or precedent of this was included in the draft order that we included in the materials. Um, does the order include the requirement of the payor to have an irrevocable life insurance policy designated to the spouse or the child as security for the support? If that's the case, then the court may say that even though the order binds the estate, um, the security that was in place to specifically uh, securitize that obligation is there and uh, no more support may be uh, necessary beyond that. Um, are there arrears uh, of support as of date of death? Are there arrears of support post date of death to the date, the time your, the client's coming into your office and is seeking the support? Because the estate uh, will be liable for properly accrued support. Um, uh, that can be uh, uh, proven. Um, with respect to uh, an interim order, uh, that also binds the estate, but if it's not a final order, um, then uh, the uh, proceeding that launched the interim order uh, will essentially stop and further support will be sought under the uh, Succession Law Reform Act. Uh, both a child or a surviving sport, uh, spouse in the right circumstance can utilize the, or, or a representative on their behalf, can utilize uh, the Succession Law Reform Act um, uh, to obtain support, um, whether there is an interim order or, or not. Um, with respect to a divorce act, it's, it's different. Um, there's no similar provision in the Dor Divorce Act as Section 34.4 of the Family Law Act. And so um, if an order is to bind an estate in the case of a divorce act, it needs to expressly indicate that. And with respect to case law that you might want to look at, there are a number of cases, but as noted in our materials, there is uh, two uh, Ontario Court of Appeal cases, one being Katz versus Katz, which is the site is 214 ONCA 606. And the other one is DAG versus Cameron Estate, 217 ONCA 366, which touch upon the obligations of uh, an estate 
um, well, with the Katz case in um, uh, of a state in, in uh, consideration of where um, uh, the payer has died. And then uh, the DAG case considers uh, two spouses, uh, but considers um, uh, two uh, surviving spouses um, and, and dealing with how that's going to come to play when there is uh, uh, limited assets and both are claiming to have the right to, to certain kinds of assets. So uh, those are two cases that you may want to consider amongst others. Um, then uh, is this case ripe for uh, a claim or an application under the uh, Succession Law Reform Act? And I'll touch upon that more in a minute. Um, was the FRO enforcing uh, the support order? And if so, has the order been withdrawn from the FRO before you go to court? Um, uh, and there is some case law there that uh, deals with whether the FRO needs to uh, withdraw or the order has to be withdrawn from the FRO, notwithstanding that the FRO can enforce a post-death before you can go to court um, and have the juris and have the court have jurisdiction. So those are a number of factors. They're certainly not exhaustive, um, but those are a number of factors that you want to be thinking about before um, you develop your strategy as to how you're going to enforce. And it could be very imperfect. It could be that the surviving spouse has some information, but not much. But if you're looking at those considerations amongst others, then you can be in a position to determine how do you want to draft your materials? What information do you need from the court? What information do you need the court to order from the estate trustee when you're going into potentially enforcing a support order? So then we can move on uh, uh, in a cursory way to um, uh, what you might think about in terms of how you're going to enforce. Well, Unlike when a payer is alive, you need to have um, a representative on the other side. So post-death, who is the personal representative of the estate? You may want to enforce, but who are you dealing with? And so um, has a personal representative of the estate been uh, appointed? Is there a will? Is it intestacy? Who is going to um, uh, be appointed? Um, does your client need to be involved in that appointment a pre, uh, uh, procedure? Is there a conflict of interest in respect to the estate trustee who is appointed or is being sought to be appointed? Um, is there going to be a will challenge? Um, if there's a will challenge, then maybe an estate trustee during litigation is uh, potentially going to be appointed. And so you may be dealing with an estate trustee during litigation. Maybe in the context of the uh, uh, of a disputed uh, support enforcement or uh, an order seeking support. Uh, it may be that uh, the proceedings are set up in such a way where there may be status quo to a certain degree so that the claims can be dealt with um, uh, uh, without the appointment of an estate trustee during litigation. Although in numerous types of uh, contexts, an estate trustee during litigation may indeed be uh, appointed. So first of all, you need to know who you're going to deal with um, and who are they represented by? And is there an inherent conflict um, uh, uh, with the uh, estate trustee? That's important because part of your relief, if it's not amicable, in some cases are amicable, but if it's not amicable, um, do you need to remove the estate trustee um, in the context of the of the dependent support uh, claim. So that's a consideration. It could be that you're simply enforcing uh, accrued support and there's no issue with respect to future support. Um, and it may be, or uh, it may be the case that uh, communications with the representative, a personal representative of the estate, most likely through their counsel, um, can be worked out on an amicable basis. The estate uh, is going to require, uh, typically, that there be adequate proof that the uh, payments that were required to be pay, uh, paid, that have accrued, um, have um, not been paid. Uh, but that's where um, being in contact with the FRO office may be, uh, while they can't enforce post-death, 
uh, may be an avenue sought uh, uh, to support that. Um, so there is uh, an amicable situation potentially, but what if, what if it's not amicable? Then it's determining whether you are seeking to enforce a contract. Um, are you seeking to enforce that informal agreement I mentioned earlier, uh, which is an agreement, but done in an informal way, I should say more accurately, um, uh, between two spouses. So it's an enforcement of a contract. If it's a domestic contract, is an enforcement of that kind of contract. Um, uh, and there's no court order in that circumstance per se. Uh, and maybe there wasn't a court order um, in that circumstance. So it is a straight uh, contract enforcement issue. Is it rather than, um, or in the alternative, uh, enforcement of an order? Um, and I just touched briefly on uh, the FLA and the Divorce Act. So you need to go back to the order and determine um, if it's specific as to the support obligations uh, or support rights um, and enforcing that order. Um, and it could be a case of if the order is um, uh, valid and didn't end on uh, the death of the payor that you may consider a contempt proceeding as against the, um, as against the estate trustee um, but that also involves other types of uh, uh, interim proceedings or interim relief um, because the, the order would have been against the estate trustee. And so if you're considering a contempt proceeding where people might want to jump to, be careful about the rules um, because the order wasn't directly against the named personal representative. So it may be that an initial order may need to be sought as against the estate uh, to enforce before there can be a contempt proceeding. But again, that's just part of the consideration and going through the contempt motion rules. Um, and so uh, you're finding yourself in, the, in need of bringing a proceeding um, and uh, the support that has been provided in the past doesn't cover off all the support rights uh, in the future or adequately cover off even uh, past support, perhaps. Um, so there's the possibility of bringing a uh, application under the Succession Law Reform Act. Um, and again, it's uh, going to Section 57 of the Act and 58 of the Act, um, which are under Part V of the Act, Part V of the Act, um, and determining whether your client is indeed uh, uh, dependent. Um, and Section 57 uh, defines dependent, and then you can follow the definitions uh, of spouse, and they're also contained in our materials. Some things to consider, though, if you're going to court um, uh, in any of these proceedings, including a Succession Law Reform Act, things to consider. Um, and again, not meant to be exhaustive, but meant to be touched upon, to be considered before you actually bring your application. Do you know the assets of the estate? Does there need to be an order sought requesting a listing of the assets and the liabilities of the estate? Does there need to be consideration um, as to the sale of assets? Is the, is the uh, estate liquid or illiquid? Could be that the estate has a number of properties that are worth millions of dollars, but there might not be much in the way of actual cash. So the estate may be illiquid, but be quite healthy from a net uh, uh, perspective and very able uh, to pay the required support, but not based on the liquidity at the time. So do assets need to be sold? If you don't know that, maybe that's going to be included in your relief um, in the alternative. Um, are you seeking interim support uh, so that the spouse, the surviving spouse has support along the way until your application under the SLRA uh, perhaps, or even under enforcement, uh, can be heard. Do assets need to be frozen in the estate? Bear in mind, if the thought is to freeze assets in the estate, and it's one that has uh, ongoing expenses, how do those ongoing expenses get paid? For example, what if there's the the properties that I mentioned, but not a lot of, but some cash, but not a lot of cash? If you freeze the estate, who is going to pay those expenses of the properties? Also. Um, will you be looking for security in terms of the assets? So requiring that certain assets 
can't be dealt with? What if your support claim is going to involve uh, the transfer of one of the properties and specie to your client? Um, it may be that you want to ensure that that particular uh, property is frozen. What about Section 72 of the SLRA, which deals with the ability to claw back assets? Um, uh, and Section 72 particularizes the kind of assets. But bear in mind uh, the Dag Cameron case I mentioned earlier and how life insurance policies may be considered by the court. So it might be that one thinks that they're covered, or in fact, they are covered um, from a life insurance policy in terms of security for support. But it's something to know about um, before you uh, or as you're um, developing your strategy. Also, with respect to document production, do you need information regarding the um, uh, the assets of the deceased estate? Should there be an order that allows uh, their surviving spouse's counsel to contact financial uh, institutions um, and obtain the documentation, or alternatively? require that the estate trustee do so and turn over that documentation uh, to uh, to the surviving spouse or their representative as, as applicable. Um, and so there are a lot of things to consider if you're just seeking support um, and you want to enforce and you're bringing your application as to what you might um, include in it. Um, a couple of things to also remember, is that an application under the SLRA should be made within six months of probate. Um, but after those six months, the court in an appropriate circumstance can deem it just to allow a support uh, application to, uh, to proceed, but only with respect to what the remaining undistributed assets are at the date of the application. Another thing to think about with a support application or any kind of application seeking to freeze assets of third parties and third parties perhaps under section 72 of the succession law reform act um, is do those parties need to be made uh, sorry do those third parties need to be named as parties to the application are they going to be put on notice are you seeking to claw back uh, an asset that's been designated to a third party um, and you're seeking to do that but the court says well have you put them on notice um, and so those are types of things that one needs to consider as well. So in thinking about how to support, uh, how to um, enforce support obligations, it's really about thinking about the context of the actual support obligation before death, on death, and post death, but also in the context as to what the rights are and what are the governing documents, or at least the seminal documents that you're going to consider before bringing uh, a legal proceeding, um, and, and that will inform you as to how you want to develop your strategy um, of seeking rights in the most cost-effective and timely way, and in a way that um, protects your surviving spouse, and in a way that allows your, your surviving spouse to continue living their life when uh, an application might not be actually heard for two years, i.e dealing with interim support or dealing with might be, which might be negotiated with the estate trustee, but also as to how the estate's gonna be dealt with. And again, when uh, an application for support is brought under the SLRA, then uh, uh, there should not be, unless there's a separate court order or all those involved or need to be involved consent, um, there uh, ought not to be and cannot be any distributions from the estate. So it can be a strategy to bring a dependent support application to be able to uh, place your client in the best situation to achieve their result, understanding that you need to manage how the estate's going to be dealt with while you're bringing your claim. So with that in mind, uh, Peter, um, I think there's some period of time for questions. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions, I, I encourage you to, you know, you can speak up and you can ask it uh, uh, just like this, or you can uh, put it in the chat uh, and I can field it and and ask those questions to Craig or, or Megan, whoever it's appropriate. I've got one uh, question and, you know, I, I think I know the answer to it, but I, I think it's a helpful way. To, I'm going to ask the question because I think it sort of helps frame uh, the discussion that 
we've had with, with Megan and Craig. And, and thank you both for presenting on this. We got a lot of information today. Um, and, and so, I, you know, I think there's a lot of, lot to go home with and, and think about. But my question is really this, let's put a, ourselves in the, you know, shoes of, of a client that comes to the family lawyer. They had a, a longstanding relationship with this family lawyer. The family lawyer was able to get them an order for support against their ex-spouse. And then they come to them and they say that their ex-spouse has now died. Um, and, you know, they, they want to, continue getting support, but they're concerned about what's going to happen now that the ex-spouse has passed away. Um, you know, you're you're the family lawyer here. Are these circumstances in which, you know, you should be recommending that, you know, you can't speak to them, they got to go to an estate lawyer and talk about it. Are, are, do you think that you're going to have sufficient knowledge to be able to give them the recommendation that they need? Or if they do go to a family lawyer, are you still going to be involved in in the process to getting that uh, support post-mortem, um, you know, either that's, that's available for either Craig or, or Megan. Well, too. well, as the estate litigator, um, I think this question is self-evident and it's not intended to solicit, but of course I'm going to say yes to that question. Um, uh, uh, unless the lawyer practices in both areas of family law and uh, uh, estate litigation, um, it's prudent to be consulting with an estate litigator um, uh, uh, in respect to this. And again, it's the purview that might come up post-death. Is a will being challenged? Who is the personal representative of the estate? Are you going to remove that personal representative? Is this an application under the Succession Law Reform Act? Is a will um, going to be interpreted? Is that going to slow down the process? Are there multiple spouses? Uh, and how do all of those claims fit together? Um, I've had cases with three spouses, uh, two from previous divorces and an existing common law spouse, all vying for support under um, uh, under the estate um, and how to deal with all of those. Um, those are just an example of what um, might be on board for, for coming. Are there minors as the children's lawyer's office going to be involved? Um, are there charities involved? It, it, are there people who are incapable? Um, is the public guardian and trustee going to be involved? Are Section 3 counsel going to be involved? All of those kinds of uh, issues can arise amongst many others. Is there a constructive trust claim? Is there a resulting trust claim um, that can be uh, coupled with your claim for support? It may be that when you're making your claim for support, um, your your actual uh, legal proceeding includes those types of claims. Is it a joint family venture that you're also going to be seeking a part of by way of support? So there's many things that could be on the table. Um, and so, yes, most definitely, I would be saying that a, a state litigator should be consulted. Great. Thanks for that. Um, I see uh, Athena McBean has her virtual hand up. I know there's some other questions in the chat, but uh, she's got her hand up. So I'm, I'm going to uh, allow her to ask the, the next question. Go ahead, Athena. Thank you. Um, I think I might know the answer, but in a situation where there's ongoing litigation and an estate trustee during litigation has been appointed, is the six-month limitation period triggered? Um, when the ETDL is appointed, or do we still have to wait for the certificate to be issued? Until you have a will, you don't have a will. So um, I think that's the simplest way that I would say that. So if it's in the context of a will challenge um, and the will, there's been no probate as of yet, um, then you know, it would be my understanding that that six month period isn't going to run. Um, it could be that a will challenge comes after probate's been obtained. Um, in some jurisdictions, it's um, uh, possible to get uh, a certificate of appointment relatively quickly. So what if that happens and then somebody brings an application to challenge a will and there's an estate trustee during litigation appointed? That would be something that would have to be uh, dealt with by all the parties. It could be that that certificate is returned to the court uh, to be held by the court and that the estate trustee during litigation is going to administer the estate. But on a, um, on a, on a basis of looking at the section itself, 
it it actually refers to six months from grant of uh, letters probate of the will or letters of administration unless the court orders otherwise. So um, uh, I think that those are you know things to think about. Great, thank you. Good question, Athena. I've I've thought about that one myself in the past too. Um, here's a here's another question. If there is a final order uh, for no child support, so there's no child support in this order, but then the the parent passes, um, can the other parent bring a dependent support claim against that uh, deceased parent's estate? Yes and no. And so, uh, sorry. Uh, Megan, I think that's a post-death question. Um, uh, the answer is yes or no, okay? Um, and it's not meant to sit on the fence. It is possible for a parent to bring a dependent support claim on, on behalf of a child if they're not in a conflict of interest. So if that parent is making their own dependent support claim or seeking any kind of asset from the estate, perhaps by way of a constructive trust, resulting trust, joint family venture, or the other typical types of claims that a uh, surviving spouse might bring as against an estate um, could be uh, on the basis of a contractual enforcement dealing not with support, but dealing with a loan or something like that, then uh, uh, if there is a, a conflict, then that parent can't then both be making the claim that I just mentioned against the estate and uh, bringing a claim for support. That might extend out to if if the surviving spouse was in fact challenging the will, um, and then the children wants to bring at the same time a dependent support claim for the children. Um, as we know, um, in the case of uh, a, a death, um, uh, any uh, legal proceeding as against a minor needs to be served on the uh, 